This is Johnny Dosco. Stay tuned for another Score Sheet Podcast. Holy Kadelka. Hello, and welcome to another Score Sheet Podcast. Today I'm happy to say we've got Nick Minix as our guest. Nick is uh, the baseball guy for KFFL.com, has been on with us a few times before, and is always a pleasure to talk to. How you doing today, Nick? I am doing fantastic, Jeff. How are you? I'm good. You're probably happy because you're down in Southern California, which is way warmer than the rest of the country. Yes. It'll have a really positive impact on your disposition, so I usually don't complain at this time of year. Yeah. I mean, I'm in Northern California, not that far away, and it's supposed to be 22 degrees at my house tomorrow morning. Youch. <laughs> yeah. So I'm staying inside. Well, let's see. We'll move right on to baseball. Um, I think probably here the first week of December, the biggest news is some of the free agent signings that are finally coming down the pike and probably even bigger news, some of the trades that have come down. Um, what do you think about a couple of these recent trades? I guess the biggest one would be Fielder for Kinsler. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting one. I mean, in a sense... You know, Detroit kind of solves their problem at second base. Obviously, they, I, they probably didn't have a lot of interest in bringing Omar Infante back. Kinsler gives them a clear upgrade at second base, especially offensively. To me, it was kind of strange. I mean, offense has never really been a problem for them. Maybe the balance of the lineup a little bit more so, but top to bottom, it was still a pretty solid lineup. So I don't think the impact of this is going to be quite as great on Detroit's side, at least from my perspective. But obviously, it opens up a spot for Jerks and Profar. I think it's, I mean, that's going to be a really interesting thing. The only question to me then that becomes is, for instance, in fantasy terms, especially in a Roto game, this has become an instantly a, an overvalued player. I think that's the kind of thing that concerns me because, to me, Profar, incredibly talented player, but I think we're a little ways away from seeing the kind of things that he's been forecasted to have an impact in as far as especially the power. I mean, I think he could have a, uh, an impact in the speed category. Really not so much the power is going to come right away. And, and the only thing that really helps that is the ballpark that he's going to be in. He's a solid hitter. I think that he's going to provide you know potential for 15 plus homers, maybe you know, 20 plus steals. But I think you're looking at kind of the ceiling there. I wouldn't want to project anything more than that. And I certainly would be wary of the fact that there could be a bit of a, f a lower floor than people expect. Yeah, I mean, for the last year or two, I've been people talking about him being the next great thing, you know, the next Mike Trout or going back, maybe the next Willie Mays kind of guy. And I agree. It, he just seems like another guy that he has a pretty good ceiling and he's going to be a good player. But sometimes the rush to proclaim the guy the next Babe Bruce seems a little overblown. Yeah, it does. And I think it primarily a lot of these things come about. I mean, he's, I don't think there's really any question that he has the physical tools but a lot of it is kind of what you consider projectable. And, I mean, there are a lot of physical things that come with, for instance, hitting with power. I mean, yeah, I think he has a, a swing built for it. We've seen him in limited at-bats where he is, uh, I believe, not long after he debuted. He hit a couple of home runs within the first week of his debut. I think that that's a product of the kind of mechanics that he has. But, I mean, I'd like to see him add a little bit of weight, a little bit of muscle, things like that. I mean, this is you're, you're talking about physically a, a rather immature player. And really, it's only technically as far as his skills go that are innate, that are really, you know, kind of put him in the class of players that we consider really top-notch fantasy prospects down the road. But... It just seems like maybe he hasn't physically matured quite like a lot of other players have at that age that we see break out. I mean, Mike Trout looks like a man, to put it in simpler terms. That's just really where it seems to be that the drawbacks are. But I mean, there's, I don't think there's any question that he's going to make an impact one way or another. No, it'll be good for him to have a position. I think that one thing maybe some people don't realize as much about trades as they should is that it's not just the players getting traded. It's, it's the other guys that suddenly have a job open up. And I saw Ryan Hannigan was... And they traded to the Rays, so suddenly that catcher for Cincinnati, Mesicaro, instead of being in a platoon situation or fighting for a job, now he's kind of been handed the starting catcher job. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, you make, you make a great point about the fallout from trades, particularly what it means for fantasy purposes when we've seen it for the past couple of seasons with a number of players, that young players, that seems to really have been a big thing. And I think, yeah... For Mesoraco in, in Cincinnati, I think that that's big because I think the first big step to getting Mesoraco that opportunity was the firing of Dusty Baker. I think he, Baker was kind of reluctant to play the young guy. And, and, and I mean, it's somewhat it's understandable, I think, because Mesoraco didn't have a, as much experience dealing with the pitching staff. And it was easier for Baker to justify that kind of move as opposed to some of the others where he simply wouldn't relent uh, because of the veteran presence. But I mean, Mesoraco proved when uh, Hannigan was injured for a good portion of last 
last season, Mezzarocco had to play five days a week, and he hit pretty well. And I think that, that just kind of proves to the Reds that it's time to give him a shot. I mean, for better or worse, I mean, you go with a guy who has, you know, you have has a greater ceiling. I mean, it may not work out well necessarily in that first year, but this is a player that you've kind of projected to be your, your guy for the foreseeable future, and I think you have to go with him sooner or later. He's as ready as he's ever going to be to take that job. I mean, they have a, a reliable backup in him now that they signed Brian Pena. So I think it's a he's a great player to target and for fantasy purposes as a guy who may not because he's kind of that post hype prospect that people talk about. I mean, catching is it's a it's a difficult thing to adjust to for most major leaguers. I mean, for a catcher to truly come up and handle things defensively and then also hit well. That's a real accomplishment, and there are so few players who are capable of it, even uh, among prospects, whereas we can think of a lot of prospects who come up and make impacts at plenty, pretty much any other position, and we think that that's the way it could translate for catchers. It's just so much more difficult to do. He's got a good chance to be a good player, plus you know, a lot of people still draft based on last year's numbers, and since he didn't get to play as much last year, I think he's a guy people will be able to get farther down the draft. He's not going to be going way up there like a Brian McCann or something like that. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, primarily, yeah, the price is, is going to be attractive for that. Well, and, you know, there's other guys you got to follow that do things like that. Fister got traded away from Detroit for basically a bag of baseballs, but <laughs> so now I guess Drew Smiley has a, a slot in the rotation is what I'm reading. Yes, yeah, and Smiley is a guy that I've liked really since not long after he debuted a couple of seasons ago. And I mean, he was a player that I kind of had my eye on this this past season and, and even in mixed leagues, hoping to perhaps get an opportunity to pick him up as soon as that opportunity became available, that I'd be willing to pay a little extra, a little more than somebody else might be, because I really valued, I think, the skills. I mean, he has the ability to strike out seven or more batters per nine innings in the starting role. I mean, he was doing well over that as a reliever. Detroit's rotation, if I'm not mistaken, for the past couple of seasons has been completely ready dominated. And so it's going to be good for them to get a left in there kind of just alludes to perhaps how much Detroit really values getting him in I think that they see a really high ceiling for him and one way or another they were probably going to try to create a rotation spot for him and I think it's 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 super justified I think that this is kind of guy who's going to be a next breakout thing I think he could be a fantastic sleeper obviously you have to worry a little bit about any caps but he'll be the guy that they occasionally skip and things like that and so ultimately I mean he really looks like a really attractive player to me yeah no I like Smiley I had him on couple different teams last year well speaking of sleepers you must have a favorite sleeper or two you're going to be targeting this year yeah i definitely do and it's been matt adams i've kind of i've targeted him in a couple of off-season mock drafts already i think that obviously first base is is kind of been a position that fantasy players in general have kind of presumed that this is where there's a lot of depth and things like that. In the last few years, I think that that has really tapered off. It's really become a top-heavy position. You see a lot of first basemen drafted in the first couple of rounds, and then you're taking a chance with a lot of guys. As far as mixed leagues go, uh, especially, I think that that's probably easier to see that the depth is really not, I guess, quite as attractive as it used to be at the position. I think you have a lot of question marks, but I think that that is maybe kind of all of a sudden shifted around with the emergence of Anthony Rizzo. I think that he's another interesting sleeper, but uh, Matt Adams with the loss of Carlos Beltran in St. Louis, I mean, this pretty much guarantees that Adams is going to be the guy for St. Louis next year. And he hit something like 17 homers in much less than a half a season last year for them. And if you look at the minor league numbers, everything about them says that this guy is not just a free swinging slugger. I mean, he, he has the ability to hit 270 or 280 pretty comfortably. Uh, he can draw a walk. I mean, I think that there's a lot of things he brings to the game. He does strike out a fair amount, but he's not Adam Dunn or any, anything close. I mean, I, I'd much rather have him than an Adrian Gonzalez, whom people just consider who he's reliable and he's going to hit me 25 home runs and bat around 300, and that's great. But I want a guy who's going to hit me 35, maybe 40 home runs. I think that that's easily possible for Adams. And I love the allure of the upside. If it turned out that I thought I had to take him, you know, say in the top 60 or 75 picks in a mixed league, even though uh, I had not had to do that yet, I would still probably do it because I think that that's just how much upside he has. Wow, that's pretty high. So you figure that Alan Craig's going to move to the outfield, no problem. He did it prior to this past season. He's even played center field for them. And he's actually played it pretty well, I think. I mean, the defensive metrics even supported it. But, I mean, watching him, he's actually has he has a, a decent bit of range. Long term, I mean, I don't think that that's necessarily, you know, obviously that's not something that St. Louis will be doing because they have John Jay there. They have also Oscar Tavares who can play out there. And it's got to be getting a shot sometime this coming season. But Craig, he's probably going to be the guy in right field with Holiday and left. The one thing that would concern me a little bit for Adams, but I think he proved that he can hit left-handers on occasion, and I think is that 
simply they look to platoon in, in some situations where they move Craig to first and put someone different in the outfield. But I don't really see the benefit in that. And I think, if anything, maybe Jay is the guy that they platoon has said, even though he's proven to hit left-handers well, he's not necessarily going to provide the same kind of impact that Adams is bad wood in the lineup. They have an incredible amount of riches in St. Louis. Didn't they just trade for Bourgeois, or however you pronounce it, from the Angels? So they got, didn't they trade Freeze for him? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did acquire Borges. Yeah, that's true. And and that so that's I mean that may be turn out to be a platoon situation for them in center field. I mean I guess it's a possibility that they are extremely flexible now with first base and and right field and center field. To me, the arrangement Adams going at first base. I mean I think it's going to give them the best possible lineup. And Borges is not necessarily a huge offensive threat. Uh, like no. Uh, and if anything, is probably just a reliable fourth outfield or pinch runner type and things like that. Right, but they're going to have to bring Tavares up pretty soon, I would think. So, I mean, I would love to be the St. Louis general manager right now because you got, <laughs> I mean, you could trade Matt Adams. There's a lot of teams. You alluded to first base. The depth really isn't there. I, I think you're right. I remember a couple of years ago I thought, oh, I'll just get a first base and later I'll find one with 25 or 30 homers. And you know, I ended up getting stuck with someone who hit about 14 homers and every other, not every team, but a lot of teams had 40 homers. I was really in a hole. Yeah, that does. I think that that's really kind of the drawback that, that's probably a lot of folks easy to overlook when they think that it's easy to get first baseman later is that there are a handful, you know, you know, half a dozen or so that can deposit 35 or 40 home runs. And if you're looking at a guy, I mean, Billy Butler, um, you know, you can run down the list of popular kind of consolation prizes at first base. And I mean, he hit like 13 home runs. P folks were thinking this is the next guy to hit 25 or 30. That's a nice projection. Uh, it wasn't necessarily something I could support. Uh, you know, obviously it was a great season in 2012 where he hit around that number. And we, and we all thought that like, the next number was coming. But I think that it's really given the uh, kind of the ranges of numbers we can expect from first baseman and those tiers below the first few rounds of players. I really don't see that the the, uh, the reliability is there or anything like that. I mean, you're taking a chance. Obviously, Chris Davis is a fantastic find. If you can get him coming in in those middle rounds, and that's, oh, that's fantastic. But that's, you know, that's more of a, a throw of darts. I mean, you could have been just as likely to land Anthony Rizzo or uh, Billy Butler, and then you put yourself in a hole of 15, 20, 25 home runs behind the next guy. And that's not really easy to make up, especially in this day and age of fantasy where power has become a, a much scarcer commodity, I think, than people realize. Yeah, no, the Chris Davis, I mean, that's how you win fantasy leagues. You pick a guy in the 15th <laughs> round that, you know, is a near MVP candidate. But as you said, that's, exactly. that's like throwing darts and, or buying a lottery ticket. Let's see. Well, sticking to the West Coast for a second, I, as a Giants fan, i got to ask you what you think about Tim Hudson. I mean, he's... He's almost my age, <laughs> which is ancient. I'm a grandfather almost. As a Giants fan, I wonder if they're really going to get anywhere near 30 starts out of him and how he's going to do. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's a f it's fair to wonder because of the age. And he, I mean, he did have Tommy St. John surgery fairly in his career. I mean, you have to wonder if he's, if he's starting to break down. Other than that, I mean, health has not been quite as much of a problem for him. I'm, I'm not real down on the deal. I mean, I think overall it's not necessarily a bad move. It is kind of, to me, it is kind of a strange, a little bit of a strange fit because he's really started to become a, a pretty heavily reliant on the ground balls. And that's not necessarily a bad thing as far as San Fran. I mean, San Fran's defense, I guess, to me, is kind of middling. They're not great. Pablo base. Sandoval at third base. Yeah. I mean, he'll gobble <laughs> up ground balls, I'm sure, a thousand a, a week. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, it's just, it's a little bit of a strange fit. I think that, uh, I mean, in San Fran, to me, they do have a couple of interesting, somewhat interesting pitching prospects behind what you would pr project to be their top five guys. I think it's not a bad move. I thought it was a pretty good move to uh, re-sign Ryan Bogosong. I think this past season was actually just kind of a fluke as far as his performance goes. I mean, I think a lot of it was health related. And part of that was, uh, I think, that actually that his, he pitched in the World Baseball Classic. And I think that the innings he built up there, I think they were a lot more harmful for a player like him than they were for, perhaps for some others. And certainly for real relievers. I mean, in general, we've seen that uh, they those things seem to impact starting pitchers just a little more. And I, there's not a lot of data that supports it. I think it's it's a case-by-case -case basis. And I don't think that they're that by pitching in the World Baseball Classic, Vogel song did himself near the Giants any favors. So I think that there's a lot of reason to believe. I mean, he I think he pitched 
fairly well in a few starts once he finally came back from the disabled list and really started to resemble the pitcher that he was before. But, uh, I mean, it's a small sample, obviously, and we know the numbers look terrible overall last season. But to me, he just as likely, if not likelier, to perform as well or better than Hudson. So it's more of a luxury move to me for the Giants. It's kind of a guy who you know is a pretty reliable fifth starter. I think Vogelsong would be among my list of sleepers because, once again, people that look at last year – He's going to drop way down in drafts. He's not really young. He did have a really very poor year. But the two years prior to that, he demonstrated that he can get major league hitters out with no problem. Yeah, he did. He did. I mean, I think that there were a lot of things about his game that this was a popular topic in you know, Ron Chandler's first pitch forums. For uh, that, I know you remember uh, believe when we were talking about him as just a player who was like, you know, can we believe in this? I believe it was in 2000, uh, when after his 2011 season, just yeah. kind of came from nowhere after he'd spent a few years in Japan. And uh, I mean, obviously, 2012, he proved that at bare minimum, he could he could pretty much back that up. And I think that, again, I think, yeah, I mean, I think last season's performance was just largely based on a lot of things that went wrong health-wise. And, and again, I think just a, a pretty strange year calendar-wise for him. I think it was uh, really not beneficial for him. And I think that, yeah, with a normal off-season for him, I think he could be a really interesting sleeper for fantasy baseball players for sure. Right. Well, you mentioned the World Baseball Classic. I mean, along with that, the Giants, thank heavens, won the World Series in 2012. So, you know, he <laughs> yeah, had a pretty short off-season. When you pitch all the way through the World Series, you're playing into November – and then you start warming up for the World Baseball Classic, you've really only got a couple months off. That's an excellent point, something I forgot. But, I mean, if, if you start to put these things together as far as, like, what players' his off seasons look like, I mean, you're talking about the potential for a lot of things to go not necessarily wrong, but differently. I mean, those things, I mean, pl these players, they, they live a certain amount on routine or um, they need a certain amount of downtime to kind of recuperate and then build up their arm strength again and things like that. And so... I mean, ideally, if you were coming off a World Series victory or even a uh, loss, uh, you'd want you know a little extra downtime. Maybe you start your offseason, your winter program a little later. But uh, the World Baseball Classic, as you said, I mean, that's that, – so in general, you, I mean, I think that those are the kind of things you look for is – I don't throw everybody in the same basket. Oh, this guy's pitching in the World Baseball Classic. Well, therefore, there must be a problem. What did the rest of his offseason look like? And those are the one. I mean, say a season ended prematurely in, in August or something like that, and maybe it's not necessarily as big a deal – uh, but maybe he had some kind of surgery, and so maybe the, the, you, you wonder why the team is even allowing him to play, or or why he wants to play. I mean, there's a, there's a number of things that go into it, and just everything is a, it, to me everything is a case by case basis. There's probably a number of reasons that you could have. Uh, I mean, perhaps that was a reason we could be could have been a little wary of Matt Cain coming off uh, a couple of short winners in the past three years. Perhaps. I mean, it's just you never know. But Matt Cain could be another candidate who could easily bounce back, as we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of positives from his numbers besides uh, what his outcomes were overall last year yeah I mean he's at that age and he's built like a guy that you know looks like he could pitch just till he's 40 no problem and he's only 30 I, I own Kane in a league and I, he's one of the last guys I'm going to worry about I think unless something happens well yeah. folks if you'd like to read more of Nick's thoughts on baseball various players and all check out kffl.com and Nick I'm sure we'll be having you back on to chat here in another month or two Sounds good to me. Uh, I'd love to do it and uh, hope everybody out there is enjoying the the off season for fantasy baseball and getting ready for it. I mean, it's starting to be that exciting time, so I'm looking forward to it. We're uh, diving into projections kind of head on here soon. This is, as you know, we're more of a, we've been more football heavy lately is because that's the time of the year for us. But, uh, you know, it's so we transition to baseball a little later than some, but we're starting to get excited about it and putting out some blogs on it and things like that, off season thoughts. So it's a pretty exciting time for us now. Yeah, no, I think December is the month when the, the hot stove season really heats up. You have Rule 5 drafts and free agents start signing in bunches and all. It should be a lot of news in the next couple months. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it and, and seeing, yeah, get, I mean, we're, we're going to get a ton more sleepers to emerge and a ton, a ton more players who come uh, come about as uh, being not so attractive players that we want to, you know, as you kind of allude to with trades and things like that. All these signings are going to affect someone else, and that's something to, to really keep in mind as we head into spring training. People will be losing jobs just like they'll be getting openings. Well, thanks for chatting with us, Nick. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your offseason. You too.